three, two, one, go. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this in the third in a series of uh, webinars on our strategic themes. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for taking some time on a Friday afternoon to have a conversation with the regulator about their strategy. I know that's uh, not necessarily how you'd uh, want to spend your time. I hope it's useful for you um, in the conversations that we're going to have over the next hour. So it's one of a number that we've done so far. We intend to sort of um, uh, continue these conversations on over the next few months. Um, to introduce myself to you, my name is Chris Day. I'm uh, Director of Engagement for CQC. Um, and I'm working with a team of people uh, in CQC today to give you some uh, an opportunity to have a conversation about uh, smarter regulation. Um, the team are uh, myself, uh, uh, Natalie, who's a, a regulatory policy uh, manager, uh, Sam, who's a, a provider engagement um, manager, uh, Steph, who, Stephanie, who's a provider engagement lead, and, and uh, Abigail, who's a senior provider engagement officer. So. As a group of people today, if you haven't been on one of these before, there's just some things you probably need to know. On your screen, you should have um, a, 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 a tool which looks like a sort of a, a question mark, which has a Q&A in it. And if you open that, you can see the, the, um, the Q&A down the side. Um, please feel free to type into the chat. I know colleagues already have uh, uh, typed into the chat and offered some questions and thoughts already. Please use that throughout the uh, throughout the um, presentation. Um, there's about a thousand of you on uh, this this call today. So if you've ever been on a uh, on a conference call of, or a Zoom meeting with lots of people on, we've deliberately muted ev every other participant. So you'll hear me and you'll hear colleagues who, who uh, help me with elements of the Q&A. So if you've got any questions or any comments, uh, please put them in the chat and then my colleagues will um, we'll make sure that they are are answered. We, we, we want to make sure we, we cover all the topics that you raise. If we don't get to a particular question that you've asked, um, we will come back to you to give you the, uh, um, a, an answer to the question that you've asked. We'll also put this as a um, as a completed video in, uh, in our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to review this again and pass it around to other colleagues who may want to uh, uh, look at this at a later date. Um, we'll do our best to stick to time. We've only got um, a, a relatively short amount of time to cover quite a lot of ground and um, I'll make sure that we, if there are some issues that are outstanding, we'll try to, uh, any big topics, we'll try to cover them in future conversations that we have. OK, so just to give you a sense of what we're going to cover today. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the focus, this is one of four, but we're going to focus on a conversation about how we are changing our, our way of regulating over the coming over the coming months. Today's focus is on smarter regulation. I'll talk a bit more about what that is in a moment, but these are a number of conversations that we're having in order to prepare ourselves to have a more formal conversation, um, probably towards the autumn time, um, about how we think about our strategy going forward. Our current strategy um, ends on the 31st of, um, of March next year. We want to make sure we're in plenty of time to think about um, what, how we'd want to change the organisation moving forward. Um, I guess one thing I've, I've realised in, in the context of trying to write strategies and then implement them is that five years is an awful long time to have a strategy. So I think the important bit for our work moving forward is how we can be responsive to what is changing, a very changeable and changing environment uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And it'd be good to get your, your conversations uh, involved in that. So um, as well as this conversation today, look out for further conversations as we move into the summer and then into the autumn. And our view is that we're going to try to look at some of the, the thornier issues of things that we've, we think we've done, but also things we haven't managed to achieve in the current strategy as we move forward. OK, um, one thing that won't change, uh, moving on to the next slide, is our purpose. So our, our purpose, is, um, much much because it's um, it's also in, in law, but for me there's a, a really important part about not just um, making sure that people uh, get safe, effective, compassionate, compassionate care uh, that is high quality, but also that we encourage services to improve and that was a when we wrote that purpose um, some years ago now that was one of the most important changes that we wanted to make as a regulator um, we don't want to be a regulator that is just uh, counting how how um how poor things are without any without any skin in the game so how things should change or improve we want to be an organization that encourages that improvement um, but we can only do that i think we can do that more effectively as uh, if we think about how 
as an organization uh, what our role is in that how we can develop our role in that i guess that the one of the other things that have, that have um, changed a lot over the time we've been regulating the last five years is the sh is the makeup and nature of, of the sectors that we regulate um we used to focus um very much on individual locations individual organizations but i guess what we've seen in the last few years particularly and perhaps more uh, brought to light recently over the um over the response to covid is how much individual organizations are dependent on each other for the quality of care that uh, the local system the local area produces so i'll, I'll touch a bit uh, more on that as I come in to talk about how we want to uh, think about our own our own response to uh, what we were changing ourselves. Ultimately, regulation has to improve uh, people's lives, and that's the point of it. it isn't isn't just here as a as a as a threshold to be crossed. It's to design to improve people's lives. Um, what I would say is, in terms of trying to become a, a better regulator, um, although that is our purpose, we don't always get things right as an organisation. Um, and I think there's a there's an important bit. Step just off the next slide. There's an important bit for me about um, how we respond to risks and concerns that happen more in real time, but crucially also how we build a better picture of the health and care across an area. So I think recognising that we we're not perfect ourselves as an organisation, and uh, just to, um, I've played a conversation I've had many times with different providers. Um, even to be an outstanding provider, you don't have to be perfect. No, nobody can be perfect all the time. The key question is um, how do you learn from from what you've done? So I think it's this is an important part for us is we are trying to learn from the things that we've done to improve. But having that ability to respond to risks and concerns more in real time not just to take punitive action but also to make sure people receive a better service and if there are concerns that are outside the the scope of an individual location or an individual provider how do we address those concerns as well as just the things that an individual provider can do and ultimately therefore having a better picture of care in a place uh, in an area um, uh, in, a, in a system or in a pathway um, those are things i think that we have um are, are, are becoming challenges that we must face there is a real opportunity i think around the way that technology uh has changed the way the health and care service is delivered to use some of that in the thinking about how we respond better to risk um we recognize that the judgments that we've we've been making over the last uh, uh three to four years have have guide, been guided a lot by our, our, our crossing the threshold inspection activity and that will be an important part of what we do but this conversation today is more aimed at, at, at how we build our picture of understanding of, of how services are performing between in, between inspections. Just move on to the next slide, Steph. Just to talk through some of the lessons, I guess we've all lessons le we've learned lessons from the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. I think one of the key things for me is how um, we've had to respond quickly to gather information in a different way. And I guess a couple of examples of that. One is um, the data uh, gathering tool that we developed for the home care uh, sector, which um, we piloted with colleagues in home care uh, over a course of a number of weeks and, and then rolled it out to all sectors um, in, in about in about four to six weeks, which is um, uh, for us a very, very quick turnaround and a quick development. And also for colleagues being able to fill that in and return that to us in a more real time basis. Key thing for me is it gave us the opportunity to have conversations with central government that we, we wouldn't have been able to have about um, access to PPE, about training and development and about providers concerns because we had that real time information. But how do we how to develop that further? How do we think about how that works? The other thing for me is the work we did on the emergency support framework, which um, again was designed to provide an understanding and support to providers locally but also to build a national picture of where we were concerned about not just individual organizations performance but how local systems were impacting on different providers and i think that the more we can do to 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 use what we know not just to inspect and regulate organizations but to help the um the thinking and the flow of information between both national uh, organisations and local organisations, the better. Um, acting on what we know and sharing that learning more broadly is important. Throughout the um, the COVID crisis, we've been interested to look at how organisations, individual organisations, and local areas are responding to uh, are responding to risk. And we've we've collated a number of case studies, about four or five hundred now, which which have looked at how individual areas and local 
organisations have responded to the challenges of COVID, both in terms of how they organise their work, but also in terms of how they work together. Our aim is in State of Care, which is towards October, is to, to, to publish those as a as a group. We'll, we'll publish them in, the, we'll publish some of those themes in the meantime, because we're, by describing what's working well and understanding why that's working, we hope that we can prompt better conversations at a local level and better, better conversations uh, nationally. There is still an important part about acting on what we know so we can we can have a good conversation uh, locally about where there might need to be a different response from organisations. So well, very practically um, how we support PHE to think about where they target PPE and testing resource in an area was something that we um, we aim to do towards the middle end of April. And I think there'll be continued conversations about what support is required to different sectors as we go through the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And, and for me, that, that's an important piece of, uh, of learning um, about our role as an organisation and what support we can offer. Just moving on to the next slide. I, uh, the other thing for me is about um, uh, how we share information um, across uh, uh, organisations that we uh, that we regulate and how we share information across systems. So providers themselves don't have to complete information more than once. The domiciliary care tracker, which is the, the, the tool we, I talked about just before, we wanted to make sure as we developed that, that we weren't uh, putting a further burden on domiciliary care providers of information that they were already uh, providing to Public Health England or other areas. So how we share that information in real time to prevent people asking for the same information is an important point. Um, one of the most important things to me is the voice of, of, of people. Um, we've seen a significant uptick in, in um, people coming to us with concerns actually not generally about their care, but more about the way in which um, organisations operate, uh, you know, how services operate collectively to, to bridge the gap between health and care or primary care and adult social care. And it's important we understand those voices because a lot of the issues that we, we might face in the next six to 12 months aren't necessarily about the performance of individual organisations, but they might be about people's experience of care through a pathway or through a group of services that, that need to provide a seamless service for an individual. Um, so we want to make sure we've, we've captured that and understand that and, and, and bring that together with the voice of care providers themselves. We've got obviously people in frontline care roles and, and actually uh, leaders in, in the care industry have a will have a strong sense of what's working, what's not and what the barriers are. Many of those good cases that we talked about uh, earlier um, a lot of the framing of those is that these are these have been good things to do despite the system, not because of it. And I think our, our role as a regulator is to try and play some of that back to central government so that we can get systemic changes uh, that support that improvement as well. One of the reasons so why you probably received a letter in the last uh, few days about local systems uh, reviews. One of the reasons why we want to do those provided collaborative reviews that look at how local systems work is to give us a better sense of what is working well, what can be, what others can learn from and where there might be systemic issues that we need to, we need to deal with, um, not just individual organisations, but actually as a health and care system, working with colleagues in public health, working potentially with, with um, government departments in other areas like housing. So how do we work together to have a really a good understanding about what a local system response to COVID or indeed to other health and care issues should be. And, and probably the last thing for me is around uh, transparency. Um, often we we are in a position where we, we it's important that we share what we know um, because if, without transparency, there's no change. If people don't perceive there's a problem, they won't perceive of a solution. So sometimes the transparency, so the information we've given out in the COVID insight reports are designed primarily to show uh, certainly what's working well, but also where there are real concerns. And we hope with that transparency, there comes the opportunity of learning and improvement. And I think one of the other themes in our strategy around um, how we support safety has to, the, 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 the key element of that for me is about how we understand what, uh, what good could look like, understand where there are issues and see learning. Um, people might often perceive us as an organisation taking punitive action against individual, individual providers. Um, that may be that may be that may be fair or, or it may it may not be fair but i think going forward we need to demonstrate as an organization that we're encouraging learning without that learning both at national level and at local level there won't be any sustainable improvement 
Just moving on to the next slide. So this is your um, you're in a, a workshop there about smarter regulation. There have been three other themes that we've been looking at as we go through uh, the, 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 re the renew uh, the renew of our strategy. Uh, the first one being pe meeting people's needs, both people who use services. Uh, providers and others um, and alongside smarter regulation we've got um, how we uh, provide uh, safe uh, care for people and this, this this touches on the idea of um, of how we encourage openness honesty and learning from the way that we uh, we will work moving forward and the last thing was around uh, uh, driving and supporting improvement and that was uh, the focus of that was very much on well what's our role in shaping and understanding improvements and it's clear that in some sectors there's a strong in, uh, improvement offer from if you're in the NHS you've got NHS uh, uh, improvement that's designed partly to, uh, to to support improvements in individual organisations if you're in um, adult social care it isn't that clear where the improvement support comes from so how do we as an organisation support that but I say today's is around uh, is around smarter uh, smarter regulation and I, I think there's a there's a really strong, uh, uh, we, can strong we can strongly build on what we have done so far and some of the technology changes that we've made, and how we evolve and adapt that to create a different uh, a different offer for both providers and for uh, people who use services. Before I get into the conversation about um, uh, smarter uh, regulation, I'll just give you a sense of where the timeline is and where we are now. So we're in this period. We've been we've we've. Uh, sort of thought a bit about um, the areas that we want to try and cover in the new strategy from the conversations that we've had so far and between sort of now and the autumn um, we want to really explore each of these themes and then offer a, an outline of a proposition to you all for a conversation between sort of the autumn and into the, um, the, 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 the new year and then from the new year have a formal consultation before the strategy itself is launched. Um, that is uh, in, a, in, the, in the world that we live in that is very much COVID dependent but that's the principle about with, uh, how we'd like to uh, take forward the next period of time so it's still very early at the moment we want to have those early conversations and then come back once we've had those initial conversations with a with an offer for a conversation in uh, in, in the next phase so it starts in October. Okay so what is what is smarter regulation I guess um, uh, the, the, there, are, there are two sort of elements to me that are key in in, uh, in um, smarter regulation, um, how we gather information uh, differently uh, and for that there's a conversation about what, um, how we get information and how we use information from people who use services, how we work with um, uh, other organisations that also collect information and how we work with providers to make sure that the information that they have is used well uh, and I think in, in many respects the, um, the, the, the role of providers and indeed their frontline staff is critical in understanding risk and understanding risk to quality, not just in their individual provider areas, but also in local systems. So how do we gather that information well? And then how do we use it differently? And then from a point of, um, we, we, we have at the moment an ongoing um, uh, conversation with providers from the point at which they're registered but if I imagine it does not feel like that I imagine it feels that we we would come along every now and again we'd inspect you we'd walk away and every now and again we ask for some information uh, separately to that um, one of the one of the things I think we want to try and do with this is to develop more for providers to develop more of a service for them so we regulate um, just short of 50,000 locations um, across a range of different uh, different sectors. We gather lots of information as a result of doing that, not just from you directly, but actually from other other partners. Um, that could be an asset to you and could help you as a provider from having a good understanding about where you're performing well relative to other organisations of a similar type. But we don't use it, and we don't use it for that for that element. We use it for the act of inspection. So one of the conversations is: Do we do we open up that that information and do we have a more real time conversation with you about the information which you receive and the information we receive so that you have a sort of an always on view of the quality of your service connected to others and do we actually provide that to you as a service if you work in the in the uh, in the NHS there are organizations that provide this as a service now taking some of our data and other data that you have and giving you a service um, should that should we provide a version a version of that that is for you and if you and for that's for all sectors that we regulate so the information which which we we hold about you and the information which you have uh, making a better use of that in a in a in an always on uh, but simple to 
simple to hold way that you can use for performance management that we can use for an understanding about about risk um, and that we can both have a better real time conversation in that way it changes the the conversation from being a conversation about the act of inspection at a particular time to the act of risk in a local area which may or may not include your your uh, an individual provider's own performance but I think moving beyond the act of inspe uh, inspection and having other interventions that support improvement, it would be, I think it's useful to have, um, one of the things about the emergency support framework recently is that it, it encouraged conversations that weren't about the act of inspection, but were about the act of improvement and, and where providers were struggling and why. And I, get, I guess this is also about trust, because this is not necessarily the relationship you've been registered for some time, this is not the relationship you've had with a, a, a regulator over the course of the years that, that we've uh, that we've operated. But if we want to build a better real time picture of, of um, how services are performing, I think we need a different a different conversation about about trust and how that information is used. So what information do we share with you? How do we use some of that to share some information with the public? And the last question of that is um, there are at least 18 organisations in health and care that have some view of information collection. Um, how do we make better use of that information collectively? So, so um, individual providers provide it once and it's used many times. The conversation that we've we've um, talked about probably for a certain, as, as many years as I've been involved in health and care. But actually, what I'm one of the benefits of the of the of, uh, of the issue around COVID is it forced a conversation in quick time about how that information was used differently. It is not perfect. It is absolutely not perfect. But how do we? How do we have a better conversation with others that, 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 that regulate so we can share that information in a more real time sense? I think the openness of what we know shared with with providers and with others more frequently builds a better picture of where risk is. For me, there was always the, the biggest risk in any situation is the gap between somebody known as a problem and another group or the same organisation doing something about it. And the more we can share information in real time, I think the, the, the better we can be at managing that gap and managing that the, the risk that we run of uh, not being able to provide uh, support improvements and change in services. So that's for me, that's there are some of the things that that that, that, are, that are meaningful in the context of what smart regulation is. But just to give you uh, before we get into your questions and comments that you've made so far, there are just some things that we've with these are some of the, the conversations that we've had so far. Um, about what the tool should be in that regulatory toolkit. So I talked about the fact that we've, we've relied upon the act of inspection as the main vehicle for, for, um, for, our, for, our, for our regulatory action. It doesn't have to be. And actually the conversations around how we share information more in real time might be other bits of the regulatory toolkit. Also how we might support um, better conversations between providers and commissioners might be part of that as well. Um, how we provide a bit of, more of a tailored understanding of, of risks um, and, uh, and benefits. I think I'm particularly thinking particularly about service reconfiguration that's happening at the moment. How can you feel confident about having a conversation with us about things that you might want to do because of what's happening in a in a in your local environment? And how do you how do we help you overcome the fact that you might think I don't want I really don't want to talk to the regulator about this until I've got everything everything agreed? Um, because actually we do hold information not just about you as an organisation but about the local health economy that you that you're operating in that might be useful for you if you're developing a different regulatory approach. How can we use the eyes and ears of providers, uh, provider staff, people using services to help us understand quality and also help us understand problems in quality? Um, when you're when, I'm, when you go on to inspections, some of the best conversations you have about what's not working, not necessarily in the context of the individual organisation, but the local system, are the people of frontline delivering health and care. They they absolutely understand the relationship between different departments and also different organisations. And how do we how can we use that to to describe what we want to change and why? Um, and also, are there any aspects of our current approach that you feel are unnecessary or unnecessary burden? So, those are some of the um, the issues that I wouldn't mind exploring. Um, from my perspective, the most important part of this, just moving on to my, my, my penultimate side, is about putting people at the heart of what we do. So everything we do from the act of inspection through to um, how we write about it and how we regulate it, is done with that in mind. And I think I share um, common, we share common purpose here. I think everybody that's uh, on, on this call um, 
the reason why they do what they do is to provide a better service for, for people for, for people that use their services or are involved in their services so how do we make sure we have that at our heart and sometimes we don't get involved in a conversation about 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 bureaucracy that's that's unnecessary for that how do we keep it how do we keep it tight so that we drive that uh, change or improvement and last thing before I before I shut up there's um thank you for, for 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 coming to this conversation today there are other ways you can get involved and stay in touch so there are there's a digital platform which is on the on the screen now uh, there's also provider bulletins which you can sign up for and um, our Twitter account, uh, CQC uh, Professionals, is a is a really good way of keeping up to date with what's uh, with, with what's going on. I'll um, I'll pause there uh, and uh, ask colleagues if they have, if if my colleagues have been um, uh, compiling any questions that I can ask or any issues that we can talk through. Hi Chris, um, we have had quite a lot of questions so thank you everyone for submitting those and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, we've had a few questions about um, looking at governance in organisations, um, reflecting on the fact that we do things like well-led assessments for NHS trusts. Do we have any plans to widen this out to other sectors and other types of providers? It's uh, a really, really good question. Um, one of the things about the provider collaborative reviews is trying to understand how individual organisations and collective conversations affect the health uh, and quality of care that, that people receive. So at the moment that they are they are designed uh, as part of the conversation uh, principally about um, NHS organisations. Um, I think we, we we are looking at well led more generally and what it means to be well led in any sector that we regulate. Um, so I think there will be what we want to do, ultimately what we want to do is to, is to frame a conversation about well-led that is simple to understand, i.e. simple to know what to do well, but is clear about the relationship that we strike, not just between um, leaders in an organisation and their colleagues who deliver care, but also the conversations and the, and the way in which services interact with each other. So that we are looking at how we support the uh, a, a, a change to the well-led framework. What I'm really keen to do um, is to one of the reasons why we moved away to we moved from five key questions from a if you've been with us a while there was used to be a thing called guidance about compliance that was 800 pages long and the only thing about it was that nobody ever read it apart from um, apart from uh, uh, legal firms uh, I think so I want to move away from the idea of having lots and lots of guidance about this to a framing of this which is based on five key questions that the 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 ways in which you can be good are simple to understand um, I don't know if colleagues want to want to, want to add to that yeah, hi Chris, it's Natalie here from the policy team. Just to uh, build on your point there around, uh, we're really conscious that our assessment frameworks are large complex documents and particularly the ways in which we characterise ratings are increasingly complex um, and, and what they don't really clearly do is set out how those reflect how people experience and receive care and so we're certainly doing a lot of work with colleagues at Think Local Act Personal as well to explore actually could we think about what I statements might look like? How could we kind of reframe some of our approaches so that they're really starting to think about what should I be experiencing when I'm using services? What does a good service feel like? So, um, you know, I, I think that will be something that comes through uh, really strongly uh, in the strategy. Great, thanks both. And um, we've also had quite a few questions about um, potential duplication in the health and social care system, um, both in terms of monitoring quality in different parts, but also supporting uh, providers to improve. Could we say a bit more about how we're going to make sure that's not going to become an issue and how we might work with other agencies? So uh, what I would say is the reason to talk about this in the context of new strategies, I'm, I'm well aware this is not perfect. I'm just looking at a questionnaire about the uh, the effect us during COVID-19. In a sense, COVID-19 highlighted to us how just how difficult it was to get that sort of alignment of thinking around what we were what we were doing. We want to have a direct conversation with the Secretary of State um, and with wider uh, wider government about what we think we would do, um, what other agencies would do, and how we would work together. I do think there is more. What COVID has brought about is a sense that that definitely isn't working, um, and I think. It has. I think we should we should seize on the opportunity. In a sense, it's a isn't it a shame that we 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 seize on the opportunity of an obvious failure to do something different. But I think that's there's an inevitability to that. We are in conversation with with groups like PHE, with the uh, with ADAS, with the LGA, 
um, and with NHS Digital um, um, about how we develop different tools that, that we can more easily share information. You, you, colleagues will know that part of the issue is we all have a slightly different way of categorising almost the same thing. So the taxonomy of what we describe is is slightly different, but effectively mean, means the same thing. And I think there's a good conversation about just trying to be clear about what the outcome we're seeking from this is. And for us, only gathering information that we can't get from another source. So we're in a, we're in a, um, a good conversation at the moment about with NHS England about some of the information that they have gathered through COVID about whether they maintain that, whether that's done differently and, and, and we maintain it, but ultimately it's done once and then used by others. So I don't think it's I don't think it's um, I don't think it's perfect at all at the moment, and it does require some will. And um, what we're trying to do is to is to leverage the the problem that COVID has created to to try and leverage a different a different response. And we're you know, we're having a good conversation. I think um, the Secretary of State was going to make a speech on it today, actually, but he's he's um, for various reasons that's not happened. Um, but I think we are he is mindful of the need to try and reduce burden, but we think there are different ways into it. Have I answered does that, does that answer the question? You think. Uh, some of the ones that you're at. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, Chris. I, I think one of the kind of the key parts of that question that's come up very strongly is um, kind of duplication of information collection from providers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're kind of asking to submit the same bit of data to multiple organisations. Well, one of the things, one of the things that we, one of the things that we we might try and do through the way we share information with you is make it possible for you to so one of the issues at the moment as you'll know if you if you work with us your quite complex excel documents flowing to between organizations is not necessarily the best way to share information one of the things we talked about having a sort of always on view of quality there might be a way of, of creating effectively a dash a dashboard of information that we have from share between us but you could easily if you if you if you're asked to by a, a disparate organization share from that dashboard so at least it'd be stored in one place for you and then uh, the, 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 it then becomes an easier task rather than having to replicate that or to store it elsewhere. As I say, some organisations, if you're an NHS trust, you might work with Allocate Software who, who provide a service similar to that now. So we, we, we wonder if there's a vanilla service, a sort of simple service that we should offer to make it easier for you to share that information. But ultimately, uh, hopefully, we want to cut down on the number of requests that you're getting from disparate organisations so that you only get one request for that information. And also to say is we ne we aren't necessarily the, the we don't necessarily need to be the people that hold that information. So if it's better held in Public Health England or in ADAS or the LGA, that's fine, provided we can access it directly from them without burdening providers. I think that's absolutely that's absolutely fine. And I think what we're trying to do at the moment is establish well, who should lead on understanding and collecting that information. One of the really interesting ones at the moment is the issues around uh, well, interesting it, it, around um, information around death. So if you know, we, we um, providers give us information in some sectors on notifications of deaths, which is not quite the same as death certificates. So how do we join up some of that thinking and join up some of that information? So it's in, information is collected once and used many times. And there may be some information that we don't need to collect in the way we do today because it will come in a different form from a different organisation. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've also had some questions about our current ratings categories and whether we might be looking at making some changes there. Um, and I think some of the comments have been about how some of the current categories are quite broad. Mm -hmm. So you could have um, uh, quite a difference between providers at the top level of um, good or the bottom level of good, for example, and whether that means we might need to rethink some of that. So it's been a question on and off uh, throughout the time that we've rated organisations. So just to be just to be clear, we've not had um, a conversation internally about changing the four ratings parameters that we have at the moment. But that's not to say that we 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 which is early we're quite early on in the development of the strategy. I guess for me, there's something about inspection is one part of of how we could assess how organisations are performing, and and um, one of our one of our questions in this context is. Should we provide? Is it just about the act of inspection? Is it just about that rate? And is that is that the only thing that should carry any weight, or is there other ways in which we can provide information alongside that rating? So, for example, an organisation, um, say an organisation is is um, is requires improvement, has got a, a number of things that it needs to do. If it if it um, if it uh, goes through a journey and some of those things, um, it, it, it can it can post 
information or evidence about what it's done should that form part of what what the public see about that organization so alongside a, a rating you almost get a sort of a commentary that provides a sense of how how where that organization is traveling i'm not saying that's 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 just one of the number of ideas that come from different conversations so the short answer is there's no immediate sense that we were we were looking at changing our ratings i think if, if there are any rating category that you will will always have edges to it there'll always be a slight difference between um uh, uh, the bottom end of good and the top end of requires improvement. I think it's more for me, for both providers and for the public, about what is happening as a result of that. Going back to my transparency point, I think it's more important that um, organisations are able to demonstrate what they are doing and that the public understand what they are doing. And that's that's the that's the crucial bit for me that is probably slightly missing from the way in which we use the ratings currently, which are the only vehicle for describing quality of care in a, in a particular location. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've also had quite a few questions asking about whether we're thinking about um, taking more of a view about of the performance of commissioners. Um, and in a link to that is also a question about um, how much of the kind of ambitions in this strategy could we realise with current legislation or would we need to think about new legislation to do some of this work? Uh, um, so I think I've got, I, could, I could do the yes, no and maybe uh, part of this. So let me try and do. So um, we are doing work on provided collaborative reviews at the moment. We are clear that provided collaborative reviews which are focused on providers but give the provider the opportunity to talk about commissioning behaviour are something that we can absolutely do without any change to our legal powers. Um, but colleagues are right, in, in order to, we, we no longer rate commissioners in the way that we did a number of years ago. And if we wanted to, and if the system wanted us to rate commissioners, we would need to have that power um, reenacted. I think there's a lot you can do within the current arrangements that we have to make it clear where change needs to happen. And so I go back to, we wrote a, a, a report on um, on the local system review called Beyond Barriers um, a couple of years ago, and that really talked about a what's working well, why it's working, and what some of the barriers to that working will be. And, and in some contexts, and not all contexts, that was about commissioner relationships, not just um, well, not, not just health, but also care. So that there was a a mixture of um, of relationships in play. I think you can describe some of that without the without needing to um, formally regulate commissioning behaviour. We have said to uh, DHSC that this is an area that we, we would like to explore with them, but there's a there's a whole series of things that the, uh, the health Sec secretary may or should we, the HSJ may not uh, be able to enact in the, either the autumn or in the, or in the um, the early part of next year. And I think what our our decision has been is that we let us use the, the full extent of the powers that we have with provider collaborative reviews to showcase what's working, to showcase where the barriers might be, and then to try to uh, enact that change nation, uh, nationally. I think there is still there's still much more we can do. The key thing for me is that we um, it is important for us to have an understanding about how areas are performing. And sometimes in the past, we based our, our measures of our own performance on how many inspections we've done. And actually, there's more for me, it's more important to understand how Bristol is performing, how um, Birmingham is performing, how Carlisle is performing, because then you get a sense of the relationship between health and care, not necessarily commissioning behaviour per se, but just how those services are performing, where the issues are, where the risks are. We think, I think that will be helpful to commissioners and to providers in, in setting their agenda. And going back to the point I made earlier, nobody, nobody's trying to do a bad job here. I think it's about how we use uh, the convening power of our information to help and support conversations that happen between providers and commissioners. Certainly when we did the LSRs and recently we've done the provider collaborative reviews, some of the, the early conversations uh, have been, this is really useful information that helps us understand um, our area collectively rather than just our individual organisation and I think there's something powerful about um, giving information to organisations that allows them to have a conversation rather than just talking about their individual performance so um, I think we will be able to do this from within our, our, our existing powers there is certainly more we could do around the formal rating of commissioning but I don't think we have to do that to be able to get some of the benefit from those uh, those joint conversations. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, we've also had quite a few questions about um, data collection, in, in particular around provider information returns and provider information collection tools. Um, could we say a bit more about our ambition to improve this area of our work? I, I think both in, might be useful to hear both in the short term and the longer term. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm um, frustrated it's not an interactive experience because um, if you are a domiciliary care provider, you have been able to access uh, a different way of us collecting this information. And uh, if you're a, if you're an interested individual that was both being a domiciliary care provider and also worked in a in a registered manager setting and and more familiar with the PIRs, we've made some significant changes to to the way we collect information. I think the key thing for me about information collection is is, is sort of threefold: is um, let's only collect information that we're going to do something with. Let's not collect information for the sake of collecting information. So I think, you know, being really frank, I think there are probably times in the past that we've collected everything that we think we can possibly need to know about an organisation rather than the things that really matter. So what are the what's the information that we collect that will really make a difference to our understanding of the performance, the quality of that of that organisation or that local area? And we almost need to be really clear with collecting it on, on that basis. When we do collect it, can we make it simple to collect? Now, that might mean that we allow app based technology to support easier, easier, more real time completion of that information from uh, providers. And also it might mean that we don't we don't ask providers at all. We get it from third parties. So it may only be supplementary information that we uh, that, that we, we get directly from uh, providers. And if, if we do both of those, how we present that information back to providers in a, on a real time basis, so it doesn't disappear off into a black hole and then you only see it at the, at the points before an inspection, but it's there more in real time. So if you're not if you're not a domiciliary care provider, you won't you won't necessarily believe any of that. But it, but it, it, we have made some significant progress and changes to the way the information is collected in, uh, in, in the uh, in the development of the domiciliary care tracker. It isn't perfect and, it, and there's certainly some work to do to develop it, but it does provide a more an easier to fill in uh, 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 approach. The other thing for me is the ESF, one of the interesting things about the ESF is, well, it's a question. It's a question. It's a series of questions that you will actually form something that we complete, but you don't need to. And I think is a, um, I would I would like to see more more people crossing the threshold into provider organisations, but without the act of the act and inspection, they might just come in to help understand and share and share information. So I think better technology development, being clear about why we're collecting the information and then presenting the information back more in real time so providers can see it rather than just before or just after an inspection all the time. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've also had a few comments um, talking about whether we'll be looking at expanding the way we make judgments about providers um, beyond um, the active inspection and whether we'll use more information in a more real time way um, to make more responsive judgments um, that might inform ratings. So, um, I mean, it's it's possible, but it's difficult to. to it, so I think that this is part of the reason why I want to begin these conversations with you and show you show you some of the thinking around that. It would be useful, I think, going back to my uh, it requires improvement provider that seems some change. Um, what would it take to 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 come back and um, and change a rating on the basis of the information that's being provided? It it might be. Uh, it, it, it might be possible to do that in some sectors, in some areas, not not necessarily in all areas. And I think we want to consider that. Uh, and, the, and the great thing about being so early in the process is we can take your views on that, whether you think that's a terrible idea or a good idea and respond to those. The key thing for me is how do you if the at the moment we're based on the act of inspection and an inspection might be 18 months out of date. Um, is it better to have a more real time view of the quality of care and should that change the rating? I.e. Is it, is, it, is it more than just the act of, in, of the formal inspection that changes the rating? A good example of it is a responsive review. So at the moment, majoritively, responsive reviews do not change the, the, the nature of a, of a rating, but actually could they and should they? Um, if you if you go in uh, to respond to a concern and actually you find that not only is it not a problem but there's actually some really good stuff going in should it change the way you see uh, well-led or safe in a, in a in a setting even if you haven't looked at all five key questions and there's some of the conversations that we that we want to have I mean from my perspective I think that we shouldn't rule it out but I think there is a lot 
there's a lot to get right if we are going to make uh, that that transition. And for me, this is about trust. So if what is the basis on which we would change a rating? What information would lead to it? And, and how would we make sure that was fair and gave uh, providers and the public a fair view of what that organisation was was uh, was was how it was performing at, at any given time. So I don't think it's um it's not a decision we're going to enter into lightly. Again, I don't know if colleagues um, from the policy, what if you Natalie, if you want to offer any comment on that. Yeah, no, I completely uh, agree, Chris. I, and there's something for me about coming back to the purpose of all this. So I think under smarter regulation, what we really, you know, our really big aim on this is how do we make sure that we're sharing high quality, up to date information with the public, with providers, with all our stakeholders. Um, we know that ratings are a fundamental part of that. So how could, you know, what different ways can we work that will allow us to keep our ratings much more up to date? Um, and we're really interested in a conversation and views on how we can do that. We know that inspection is integral to how we do that work at the moment but how can we work differently how you know how could we use more targeted more focused inspections in, in the future could we actually be more effective coming in for short bursts of inspections much more frequently and then supplementing that with with other ways of working um, and i think you know, chris mentioned that idea of the regulatory toolkit you know we're really interested in what are all these alternative approaches we could take to to viewing quality how could we feed in things like accreditation like your self assessments like what information from commissioners survey results it's, you know there's going to be so much out there and it will continue to evolve as well as as, as the health and social care system changes um, but yeah we're, we're really interested in you know how do we get to that place where for everybody's benefits our ratings offer a really helpful up-to-date picture and they focus on what matters most to people so i hope you're taking from that there's no decision about that but it'll yeah. be really really useful to have a good conversation about it and as you might imagine we're talking to public groups about this as well and i think there's a there's a really there's an important trust element for both for, for both providers and the public in this it's got to work for both groups so um after this uh, event today if you've got really strong feelings on this or any views please do share them with us because they this this is generally we are at a point where the, these these are really helpful in framing some of our thinking um, over the coming months. I don't think it's um, there's, a, there's a neat answer to it, but I think there is some opportunity perhaps to see how change happens. One of the conversations I have with often with um, with uh, sector leads is um, you can't see the changes that have been acted since you last inspected me. And actually the ability to sort of share and understand how that's how that's more happening in real time and perhaps test that against public perception of, of organisations might be something that, that would that would be really helpful. But I think there's a there's a fair way to go. So it'd be good, good to get um, colleagues views on that. Thanks both. Um, we've also had a few comments um, suggesting that one of the big barriers to us being able to um, achieve smarter regulation might be consistency in our own approach. Um, and I wonder if we could say anything about um, any work we're doing to improve that or um, how much of an issue that's going to be for us? Uh, it, 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 literally, I think on day two of joining this organisation, consistency was a was a thing uh, that um, was, uh, was 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 mentioned to me. It's been probably mentioned to me every other day uh, since then. So I absolutely get the uh, the point about consistency. I think I think organisationally, we've 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 sometimes taken a view that the more you write down, the more consistent you are. So um, uh, going back to the bit about guidance, I think having um, thousands of pages of guidance uh, doesn't actually help anybody be more consistent. What it does is it does it, it frames a number of things that everybody has to consider. Um, what we would like to do, I think what lies behind consistency is a, is a feeling of unfairness and a feeling of um, uh, people not understanding individual organisations. And I think part of what the solution to this is, is only part of it, is being really, really clear and focused on what outcomes are we, when we, when we use our, our regulations, when we have our toolkit of things that we look at, what outcomes are we seeking to change? So not input measures and often we and other organizations have relied upon input measures of performance to sort of say you know how how are people how are people performing what are the outcomes that we're uh, we're seeking to measure and how do we have real and ongoing conversations with providers about those outcomes because i my my um my hypothesis and it may well be proved wrong but my hypothesis is the closer closer uh, providers and inspectors are to each other the the more they understand the organization the better judged they are of an organization's an organization's position 
And I think the more we can focus on outcome measures of what we're looking for and better conversations between the active individual inspections to give people a sense of uh, why an organisation is performing as it is, um, that the, that is, a, I think, a, a better place to be. Um, I, I would far rather have uh, a real time update for uh, of information about an organisation that is five or six pages long, but gives a real sense of this is how the organisation is performing today that the organisation would recognise and a service user would recognise. Because that's that's the that's the challenge is how do you create that that real time view of an organisation that everybody recognises? And how do you update it regularly to so it, it continues to be fair to both service user and provider? It is a challenge. I, I say I don't think we've resolved it at the moment by having thousands of pages of guidance. I think the key challenge is, is be really clear about why we're looking at what we're looking for and be really clear about how and when we update it and how that how those conversations derive the change in, in uh, our, our view of an organisation. But there is definitely more work to do. And I, but I say my, my own perception is um, having more guidance is not the answer. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've maybe got time for a couple more questions, but if we don't don't get through all the questions today, we will look to reply um, after this webinar to as many as possible. Um, we've also had um, a few questions talking about the kind of speed of change we might be taking to implement this strategy. Um, I think a few people have commented that um, COVID-19 has really uh, highlighted the, the need for urgent change in health and social care and whether we'll have the same urgency for this strategy. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that we, as an, so we've uh, implemented a new approach in ESF and if you're working in domiciliary care, in, in, implemented a new change in how we collect information in domiciliary care in a matter of weeks. We even slightly went into uh, into uh, testing of uh, adult social care uh, uh, staff for a few weeks as well. I think I think there is definitely some changes that we, as a group, uh, need to make quickly. Um, so we will continue to do that. And part of the development here. So normally in this process, we would probably be thinking about this internally ourselves, with a view to um, coming to a decision sometime at the end of the year and then having a formal consultation. What we want to do with this is to have a conversation now so we can iteratively develop some of the changes that we want to make uh, to our work. The reason why we're starting provider collaborative reviews now is because we, we think that might be part of how we want to do the future. So we want to test and trial how that works. Now that does rely upon a different relationship with you. So we, we know that we want to think about um, how we might uh, change the way we 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 uh, we approach our understanding of individual services and how we how we uh, ask them to work together to form a view of a local area that requires good conversations with 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 providers uh, collectively so that we can do that and it means that you are part of the testing of this with us as you yourselves transition in real time to to different service models so we're absolutely aware of that we've been um, been doing some work with um, digital providers in particular around uh, the the additional types of service that might be offered during COVID and post COVID, and we are well aware that we need to be supportive of that change and not a barrier to it. I would well the two things I'd say just to finish on that is if you perceive that we are we are a, a barrier to a change that you or organisations that you work with want to make, tell us uh, because we don't want to be that barrier. We don't think we are that barrier you will see a number of times where we might talk to you in the coming months to say would you help us trial this we are doing that particularly so we can either fail fast if something doesn't work or we can develop our thinking as we move towards the end of the year so that by the time we go out to a formal consultation we absolutely know the things that we want to do will work in the context of where we go with the next strategy thanks chris um Maybe to finish off, uh, this could be this might be the last question. Um, there's been a few questions about uh, whether we're thinking about changing the general size of our inspections and maybe focusing more on smaller targeted inspections rather than large comprehensive ones of providers. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think undoubtedly um, having a having a, a, a large scale inspection, large scale inspection activity um, was right for its time. But I think now we need to be more agile in our approach. So absolutely, we will be looking at uh, a more real time, a real time shared of information between organisations and a more real time understanding about how um, providers are performing and less uh, um, 
large scale inspections with um, lots and lots of people coming into an organisation. It was it was useful to get a sort of a, when we were doing that work around trying to establish a baseline for all sectors that we regulate. It, it, it was useful and did provide that 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 baseline. But what you realise from that is that there is so much that is still missing from a, a once every year or twice twice uh, once every two years inspection that you need to gain from real time conversations. The other thing about people physically being there is that we are piloting, with domiciliary care providers as it happens, availability to access re information remotely and talk to service users remotely. So do you even have to physically cross the threshold every time? In domiciliary care, obviously you're in people's homes. Um, we're, we're piloting an approach where we don't even have to be in people's homes. We can talk to people over the phone and talk to them about the, the care they're receiving. These are trials of different ways of working, but each of them is designed to reduce the burden on, on providers, but still make sure we have a good real time understanding about how services are performing. That was a yes, I think, broadly, if that's, if that's a, a better way of saying it. That's great, Chris. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, so we might have to wrap up here, I'm afraid. Great. Well, th I'm just to thank everyone. If you've stuck with it for the full hour, thank you very much for your for your time. And uh, please do take me up on the offer of, of providing some further thoughts on what you've heard today. It, it is important that we get your views on this. It will guide our thinking as we develop our our strategy over the coming months. And um, look out for further opportunities to to engage with us. Um, feel, feel free to uh, drop comments back to us through the through the groups that we've mentioned. Uh, and I hope you have a good rest of Friday. Thank you.